I'd like to thank um, the organizers, Tamara and Alexander, for um, kindly inviting me here uh, and then to uh, give me the opportunity to give a talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a joint work with uh, several people. Uh, Jiun Lee, uh, who is at, uh, at KAIST, is a professor there, and also Hao Wu, um, uh, currently a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and also uh, Pierre Radusser, uh, physicist at the uh, ENS. Right, so this is about, uh, so let me start with the following. So if you consider um, a symmetric uh, matrix M and think about the largest eigenvalue, then you satisfy this um, due to the minimax principle. Uh, it can be written as uh, lambda one is equal to maximum of the quadratic form uh, X uh, in a product with MX, well, where X runs over this sphere. Okay. Okay, so this, because this is a written in terms of maximum, so you may think about, say, a finite temperature version of this, and thinking this, uh, this maximum formula is a zero temperature version of this expression. So think about the following, the second line here. Now this can be regarded as a finite temperature version in the following sense. So instead of, so look at the same quadratic form, x uh, in the product with mx, and put that as a Hamiltonian, and, and then raise power e to the beta of that Hamiltonian, and then integrate over the sphere, right? And then take the log and then divide by one over one over beta. So if you take beta to infinity, uh, which will be beta is like one over temperature, so a zero temperature corresponds to beta to infinity. If you take a beta to infinity limit of, of this following uh, formula, um, then the using the usual uh, um, uh, thinking that the the, the 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 main contribution should come from the, the place where the the quadratic form takes its largest value. Uh, which will be the x being the, uh, the eigenvector corresponding to the eigen, first eigenvalue, largest eigenvalue, and the quadratic form becomes the largest eigenvalue, and then becomes uh, e to the beta of the largest eigenvalue, and take log, one divided by one over beta, it becomes the largest eigenvalue. So the, the limit of this one as beta to infinity will be the largest eigenvalue of the matrix M. Okay? So, so this is uh, some kind of a, so if you, we always start thinking about in random matrix, the, there's a temperature associated to this beta, in our usual sense of beta one to one to four, uh, but the largest eigenvalue itself uh, has some natural uh, finite temperature uh, variation of it. Okay. So that's the thinking that uh, I was having, we were having. Uh, but then, and of course this is natural thing, which means that it should have appeared somewhere else as well. And in physical literature, this is known as the uh, free energy of the so-called spherical uh, sharing the Kirkpatrick model, so SSK model, which I'm going to explain uh, in a second. So this SSK model is a special model in the so-called spin glass in the statistical physics. So in general, a spherical spin glass model, there will be a spherical version of that and also hypercubic version of that, uh, is defined by generally, not necessarily this quadratic function, but more general Hamiltonian, say a random symmetric polynomial H. So I think H of sigma is a polynomial with coefficients. Uh, this coefficient sh this should be a symmetric polynomial and these coefficients are regarded, say, uh, random. Okay. So you have a random Hamiltonian, and that random Hamiltonian, well, any, any Hamiltonian, uh, will define a Gibbs measure, defined in the following fashion. So there is a temperature, inverse temperature beta, and you raise power e to the h beta of sigma, and divide by the partition function. And this will define a measure uh, for variable sigma on, on a sphere. So in this particular case, we will take a sphere to be uh, in the n-dimensional uh, uh, sphere uh, of radius root, root 10. The root 10 is not a particular thing, but uh, we would just pick to that particular one. So this is a measure, so Gibbs measure, associated to the Hamiltonian H. But since the Hamiltonian is, is random, just like a, the case of random matrix, uh, quadratic case of Hamiltonian is going to be the associated random matrix set setup. So because Hamiltonian is random, the Gibbs measure itself become random. So the situation is that there is a double randomness. So you pick your matrix or Hamiltonian randomly according to your uh, or, or, or choice of the matrix. Once you pick it, and then you look at your uh, the Gibbs measure, 
and you pick your spin sigma according to your Gibbs measure. Right, so there's a double randomness here. And then you can study about um, um, those properties of this sigma. Okay? So this is a, is a well-known model in, in, uh, in statistical physics, and the AFN is simply the free energy of it. Okay? So the, of course, one can think about this only in many different setups, and sigma is a sphere case, uh, but you can think about the sigma on other manifold or uh, graphs, the particular case when the, 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 uh, the this, uh, sphere is replaced by this hypercube, minus one and one and and, 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 and n dimensional hypercube, is an important case, and that's the usual uh, uh, spinless case. And the spherical case is supposed to be the uh, simplification of that. And the, um, so there are probably two different sources for the interest of, of this model. So first one is the actual spinless model itself. It's, it's, um, it's proposed in the, in the 1970s in the physics community uh, because there are some peculiar um, magnetic properties of some, uh, strange, some, some certain kind of alloy um, where uh, the, so there's, I think there's some manganese and, and, and aluminum alloy. And, and in, the, in, the case, in that case, the, man, uh, the, the manganese atoms are, ions are not located in, in kind, of kind of regular fashion, but rather randomly located in the alloy. So it's like a classy kind of feature. And on top of that, the, uh, the inter interactions of, of those uh, uh, atoms are not necessarily, they, 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 they have a spins, the magnetic spins, they are not necessarily all, uh, have a, 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 that doesn't want to be aligned in the same, same, same direction because of the, the way that they, uh, uh, the, the potential was, was given. The potential was satisfying this highly oscillatory thing. And therefore, sometimes you don't want to be not necessarily in the same direction, but the opposite direction will give you a higher uh, magnetic uh, force. Okay. So to, 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 uh, to model it, uh, the simplest case was that you put all these atoms on the uh, lattice, but rather than, than they, they are allowed to have a, a random uh, interaction between the two atoms, the two ions, and then the interaction could be either positively correlated or negatively correlated, and the correlation is randomly given to you. Okay, so that was the, the, the initial model, and that has an Isenkite kind of, um, uh, model in it. Uh, but that has become a little bit difficult, and then um, people change it to the uh, mean field case where the, every atom is uh, going to be uh, interacting with each other. Uh, that will be the, the hyper, hyper um, uh, cubic version of this spin model. On a different uh, 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 direction, um, this question of finding the maximum of some symmetric function over some manifold is such a natural question. Right? This is a problem, some problem like this is a problem like uh, in calculus one or calculus three, right? where you have multivariate calculus, you are given the, uh, you find the maximum of some variable in many, in many, in many dimensions, and confined on, on some sort of fear, and then you have to do the Lagrange multiplier and have to solve it, right? And this is uh, some kind of a, a version of that where your function is randomly given. Okay, and those problems sh uh, should arise in many different contexts, and uh, uh, this finite temperature variation should be uh, some kind of relaxation of this uh, ma the maximum maximization problem to a supposedly simpler problem. So we, because if beta is uh, small, beta is so small, say zero, <laughs> then this is very easy to integrate. When, when beta is getting higher and higher, uh, it becomes uh, a little bit more complicated. Okay. So there's a long history of studying uh, this for general H. Uh, but what we want to do is, here is that uh, for the special case when this uh, uh, Hamiltonian is quadratic, then, then there's a natural relationship of uh, this problem to random matrix theory. So maybe we can use uh, random matrix results to say something about uh, uh, this Gibbs measure, maybe spin distribution, and also of free energy. That's the goal of, of, of this lecture. Okay. So we will think about three particular uh, setups. So the, the first case is that uh, this is purely uh, quadratic. And second case is that there is a quadratic and uh, plus deterministic uh, quadratic uh, uh, form here in a particular form. And the third one is that uh, it's going to be a linear function of sigma. Okay. And then the second is called uh, SSK plus uh, CW, which I'm going to explain later. And then this is, uh, is regarded the external field uh, given to the, uh, to, to the model. Okay. So the goal is we, we have to use random matrix theory to study fluctuations in particular, 
of the free energy and also uh, spin distributions uh, uh, later. Okay. So in our um, uh, um, convention, we assume that the semicircle law has a support from minus two and two. Um, okay, that's the, the way that we pick M. So M is going to be Wigner, real Wigner, um, whose uh, so limit has the support uh, of the semicircle law is, is, is minus 10 two. So in particular for one, for the um, beta equal, uh, t equals zero, which is beta is infinity, the zero temperature case, that's really uh, this Fn, this free energy is exactly the largest eigenvalue, then we know everything from random matrix theory that, uh, uh, so this Fn has this uh, scaling by one over two, so one over two gives you, you know, two divided by two becomes one, so that's the largest location of the largest eigenvalue, and has a fluctuation given by trace rhythm with the fluctuation order given by one over n to the two third. Okay. And the question is, well, how does it change if you increase your temperature? And also, uh, in the case of two and three, there is an interaction with uh, other deterministic part, and how does that change? Okay. Right, so here's the outline. Um, so I'm gonna start with the pure SSK mother, where there is no, it's purely quadratic. And then I, I, I state the fluctuation results and, and talk about the little bit of history. And then um, the entire thing will, uh, will be com computed using some random single integral representation of the partition function, uh, which I'm going to formulate. And then after that, I'm going to st state uh, there is a phase transition that will happen depending on your uh, temperature. And in one case, the linear statistics of the eigenvalues will play the role. In the other case, the largest eigenvalue will give you the dominant contribution. And I'm going to discuss that. And then I'll go on to the, the, the other two models. The second model will be very short. It uh, will be discussed only short, uh, only briefly. And then third one, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. Okay. All right. So here's a theorem. So this is uh, um, a few years ago with uh, uh, Ji-Yun Lee. So, so T is zero is was the largest eigenvalue case. And here's a threshold, T equal, Tc is one. So if T is less than one, all the way to zero, um, it change, the leading term changes tiny, uh, uh, something like this. So when T equals zero, this becomes just one. And then this part here is a trace rhythm again. So fluctuation is all the way, is still given by trace rhythm fluctuation. Uh, we do the same order of one over n to the two third. Uh, the scaling here is one minus T, so you can see that when T equals one, the fluctuation, that term just becomes zero. Okay, so that means that there should be a next order term. On the other hand, when T is bigger than one, Okay, which, which is, in terms of beta, beta is small. In that case, um, the leading term becomes uh, one over 4t, that's a constant term. And then the next term is, the case like one over n, so instead of one over n to two third, one over n, so it becomes much smaller, fluctuation is much smaller. And the fluctuation is given by the uh, normal distribution. Okay. So then normal distribution has this um, mean given by minus alpha and variance for alpha where alpha is given by this log of one minus t to the minus two. Okay. So again, as t becomes one, then this log term blows up, and so this becomes large. So it's a larger term divided by n, and here, when t becomes one, this becomes small, so zero divided by n to two, so then situation should happen in somewhere in between. So this t equals one case is interesting situation, then what, what happens is critical case? Well, we don't know yet. So a uh, little bit of, of history, how, how this thing is related. So the SSK model, spherical model, uh, was pro first proposed by uh, Kostolitz and uh, Thaulis and then Jones in 1976. And the, the limiting formula, so not the fluctuations, but the limiting term here, was com computed uh, by, by their paper using random metric theory at that point. Not completely rigorous, but I mean it should it can, could be made rigorous. Um, a similar formula also appeared uh, in the, some paper of Guillaume and, and Maida in, in different literature for the version, and also uh, Panchenko and, and Talagrand also computed those those things. So, so this leading term, the leading term, the limiting free energy, uh, is is well studied in in the in the Spinglass uh, literature. So for not only the uh, quadratic Hamiltonian, but pretty much general uh, polynomial Hamiltonian, 
And not only the spherical case, but also hypercube case. There is a general formula. So the, especially the hypercubic case, which is more difficult to case, there is a formula due to a policy. This is called, it's a famous uh, policy formula uh, in, 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 in proposed in 1980. Okay, even though there is a formula, this formula is really complicated. Uh, it is a, a variational formula, uh, variation over a functional or of a measure supported in zero and one, and computing that, evaluating that variation formula itself is a, is a challenging problem. And, if, and, and uh, showing some, something like uh, there is a unique minimizer and those things are difficult. And then there have been lots of progress in, in recent a few years. And the, the, the work that I mentioned is uh, Panchenko and Talagrand is actually computing this uh, parisis formula, evaluated parisis formula for the quadratic case was done in this paper. Okay, and then uh, this is a very, very physical paper. Um, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to justify that argument. And that was proven to be correct uh, by, in, in one, one side bound was proved by Guerra, and the uh, actual identity was proved by uh, Talarand in 2006 in his uh, very famous paper. Uh, 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 yeah, right. And also, um, for the spherical version of uh, Paris's formula was obtained by Crescent uh, and, and Somas. And also Panchenko gave a slightly different proof of the Paris's Paris formula. Okay, so those are about the limiting uh, free energy. So that's uh, the first order term, not necessarily the fluctuations. For the fluctuations, uh, things are known for high temperature. When T is bigger than one for the uh, SK model, so that I'm dropping the spherical term here. So this is hypercubic model with the quadratic potential. Uh, this was proven to be Gaussian with one of n fluctuations, which is exactly the same as this one here, one of n and Gaussian. That was the work of Eisenman and Leibovitz and Ruhl in 1987, and immediately uh, proven uh, in a slightly different method by uh, Froelich and uh, uh, Jekalinski. And also uh, Comex and Nube gave a completely different proof using Martingales. So this was for the quadratic case, uh, for the higher, degree polynomial, uh, which is Monik. Again, a uh, hypercubic case. That was uh, in the high temperature case where T is large enough. And then again, it was shown to be Gaussian and then to the some power depending on your degree. And that was the work of uh, Anton Bovia and uh, uh, Kokova and Lowe in, in 2002. Okay, so the high temperature is, case is relatively easy in terms of fluctuations. For the, um, Low temperature, it is it's harder. So of course, uh, in the spherical case, uh, P equals two, which is quadratic, then it's la the eigen random matrix problem, and which we now we know very well. Um, this is my trace with them. But however, if the degree is greater than or equal to three, so in so sum of m i j k sigma i sigma j sigma k, for example, in the degree three, then the zero temperature case, so that's a maximization problem. The fluctuation is completely different. Uh, this is very recent work of Subak and Zaituni. Um, the fluctuation is given by n to the one over n fluctuations, and it's given by, by Gumbel. So it's completely different from uh, uh, trace with them and n to the uh, uh, one over n to the two third fluctuations. Okay, the difference is, uh, is uh, due to the following thing. So if you think about quadratic form, and then try to find uh, all the local max and mean of this quadratic form over sphere. Then you have to do the Lagrange multiplier and take a derivative, and the Lagrange multiplier equation, equation becomes exactly eigenvalue eigenvector problem, right? So all the local max and local mean of this quadratic function on the sphere are the eigenvalues, and we know that there are n, what, two n eigenvalues, two n critical points because the the eigenvector could be plus and minus sign. So there are two n critical points, the polynomial number of critical points as n grows infinity. But however, what is known is that in the degree three or higher, uh, that the corresponding eigenvalue eigenvector problem for the tensors, then the number of critical points is not polynomially growing, but rather exponentially growing in n. So there are so many critical points. And so therefore, near the absolute global max, there will be near global max. There are so many of them, and they all contribute to the maximization problem. 
and then that gives you uh, their, their contributions have become somewhat independent, and so you have to find the max of all those things, and that gives you basically gumball. Right? So you know, in, in that sense, the quadratic case is, is extremely special in, in, this, in this world of spin glass. <laughs> On a slightly different uh, direction, in the sp spherical and more also non spherical spin glass model, when there is an external field, which is, sorry, to go back in here, when if you add this term, deterministic term, okay, in addition to the uh, quadratic or higher uh, general uh, polynomial, then it was shown that for all temperature, uh, it is given by Gaussian the NTD minus half fluctuation, which is also different. That's the uh, more, uh, another recent work. So in particular, there is no phase transition uh, as you vary your temperature. Okay, so I'm going to come back and discuss this one a little bit later. All right, so how does this, so, uh, okay, so that's the status. So in, in particular, there is uh, basically no result for low temperature except at t equals zero. So t between critical and down to zero, uh, basically there is no work in terms of giving you the uh, fluctuation order or the, the limits, except, uh, except this one at the moment. Okay, except this one at the moment. So how this is possible to compute? So the free energy is, uh, so free energy is, by definition, is, is given by log of the integral of n-dimensional sphere. So it's an n-fold integral. The theorem is that, well, for this specific case, there is an expression of writing this in terms of single integral. Okay, so that's much easier. So that's the, the, the theorem here. So lemma is due to uh, Costellis and Thalos and Jones. So this partition function, which is n-fold integral, can be written as some, some constant, expressed constant, over a single integral of dz of this function capital G, where capital G is a random function. Okay. So that function is a beta g, that's a linear term, and the sum of log of z minus lambda k, or lambda k is uh, uh, the eigenvalues. And this is not a random matrix theory uh, statement. This is true for any fixed matrix M, and this is, this is simply an algebraic identity. And here the integral is the uh, vertical line uh, passing through a real point gamma, and then the gamma uh, should be uh, to the right of all the uh, branch points. That's, that's the restriction, which is an important restriction. So how this is true? So it's very simple. So the Zn is this uh, integral of a sphere of this quadratic function. And you decompose matrix M as the usual spectral decomposition, U diagonal, and then uh, U transpose. And then because sphere is invariant on the unitary rotation, so you do the rotation and becomes this quadratic form with just lambda i's, lambda i and U i squared with no, um, uh, eigenvector involved. And then to compute this one, you take the Laplace transform using beta as your parameter. Okay? So in particular, if you take uh, fr to be uh, this one here, this r here is a beta, and then I just scaled so that the sphere becomes already this one, and I multiply some factor here, just for the convenience for the later uh, part. If you take the Laplace transform of this function, then we are doing the integral of, of e minus z r, the r is zero to infinity of this part of the sphere. So this is r is the radial component and the sphere. So this is a polar coordinate version of the r n integral, and replacing r by r squared, and this becomes sum of the y uh, y i squared, and then this lamp, uh, this r becomes uh, r times u i squared becomes y i squared, and then this is just Jacobian factor in the polar coordinate representation. So it becomes this integral, which is Gaussian, and then of uh, Gaussian integral, which you can compute. And therefore, by taking inverse, trans inverse Laplace transform, you get original function back, fr, in terms of this L, and that is what we have with L given by this formula, which is written in this form. Okay, that, that's, that's all it takes. Okay, so Jiyun and I found this uh, separately, and then we thought that, well, this is so simple, somebody should have known it, and indeed, it was in this uh, very classical paper of Spinglass, it was known there, naturally. And um, it, you know, many people you know, reused it and over and over. There's a paper by um, uh, Dong Wang and also uh, um, Man Yu Mo use uh, similar ideas. When they were computing these uh, spiked random matrix models. 
All right, so the question now is, well, here's a single integral. Once you have a single integral, then we, we tend to, we want to take the large n limit, so we can try to do the method speed descent, right, the usual thing that you want to do, except that the slight difference is that the integrand, integral is a random integral, right? So it's a random integrand. Okay, we want to do the speed descent, but well, how does it work? Okay, so does it, is it applicable? Well, in this case, yes, thanks to the rigidity of the eigenvalues, okay, which we, uh, um, uh, Tom, Tom discussed in his talk. Um, so the rigid eigenvalues is, uh, is the one that, it's, that means that, so what you have here is that this function g, even though it depends on lambda case, the lambda case are random on the real line, but they are not, they have, they, are, they try to be stick in their locations, and then their fluctuations are under control, right? The, the way that they deviate from this expected location is, is controllable, and therefore with that controlled error, we can still apply the, the user uh, method speed descent. But with some care, of course. Right. So the rigid of the eigenvalues, uh, which is a, a, a regard is, uh, so one of the most important theorems in random metric theory in some regards, is due to Adash and Yao and Yin in, in, in 2012. It says the following. So here's a la, the la, eigenvalues, lambda k. And these gamma k's are the classical locations, which is the quantile of the semicircle law. So you take the semicircle law and then uh, lambda k to, to two, that integral should be k over, k over n, so there's a quantile determined from semicircle law exactly. And then there is a ex explicit control of how this difference, uh, how large this difference can be. The difference can be bounded by basically n to the minus two third times, well this k hat is, is k or k difference between n minus n to, to k. So k to the minus one third and n to the two, minus two third. So if k is order n in the bulk, and the k is n basically, so it's n to the minus, half, minus one. So the difference is, difference between the classical location and the eigen, eigenvalue location is, is with almost same as the spacings of the eigenvalues. Okay, with the some, some error that you, can, you are allowed to have is n to the epsilon. In the end, it, at the edge, they are n to the minus two thirds as like the spacings of the eigenvalues. And uh, moreover, this is true uniformly for all eigenvalues simultaneously. Okay. Right, okay, so, so with that strong control, you can, you can do the speed descent. Right, so this function g, if I take a derivative, then it's going to be uh, this particular function and uh, if you plot the graph of this function for z real, uh, so this is a plot, and the g prime of zero uh, given by these a few points, and we want to condition that the real part of z should be, be greater than the large eigenvalue. So therefore, this black dot is going to be our, our zero. So because of the way that the graph works, uh, there's always a critical point, and that is going to the good critical point where our um, counter should go through. Now there is a huge difference between beta is less, this beta is bigger than one and less than one. If beta is small, and this is a picture, and beta is large, and this is going to be a picture, in the sense that this point is very close to the, 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 the branch point. Okay, so when beta is small, and you have in this situation, you can approximate this entire thing by semicircle, semicircle law, so you get beta minus the integral of the semicircle law, and the critical point minus x should be equal to zero or approximately equal to zero. And so if you solve this equation, because you can do this straight transform, and you get the critical point, this point is of roughly beta plus one over beta, which is greater than two. On the other hand, when beta is uh, bigger than one, this point will become very, very close to the, the branch point. And then we have to, we cannot approximate this one by the straight transformation. Okay, that's not possible because z is so close to lambda one. So that's different regime. And in that case, we have to make a separate estimate, and it turned out, well, when t is beta is bigger than one but fixed, then the critical point is close to lambda one, and the difference is, is basically one over n. Okay, one over n minus epsilon, with high probability. That's what one can, one can check, okay? So there are two uh, regimes. So how does this uh, give you the fluctuations? So for the high temperature case when beta is less than one, well, same as t is bigger than one, the zc is its value, almost, 
and then plug that in into the G, the function that you have to take the speed descent about. And you got, uh, here's some deterministic term, but here's a, the sum of log of that value. And this term is now, uh, becomes the linear statistics. Okay, li so the sum of the, the functions of, 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 of eigenvalues. So it's a linear statistics. When you have a linear statistics, this is a now well-known result in random matrix theory that the linear statistics has much similar fluctuations than the usual central limit theorem given by uh, uh, n to the uh, one of n fluctuation. So if you use that and do the usual speed descent, all the other terms do not turn out to be not contributing. So the, you can have the following exact formula. So fn is this number, and then this log deterministic term, there's ln, ln is this linear statistics given by this function g of this particular form, and then some control. Okay. So this is a exact relationship between uh, free energy with the linear statistics of this particular function. And because of this li uh, linear statistics and that fluctuation, it has order one of order, in this particular case, order, uh, order one, rather than order square root of n in like a uh, central limit theorem case. Okay, so that gives us the, uh, the fluctuation for the high temperature case. So, okay, so let me just go back in here. Sorry. So that will give us, give us this statement. So it's interesting to not think about the following. So for the high temperature case, the Gaussian one of n fluctuation was already known due to Eisenman and Lubovitch and Ruel. So in a way, they were already doing uh, linear statistics of, of, of eigenvalues without our usual tool of random matrix theory, right? So in, 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 our, in random matrix theory, this uh, linear statistics result is a very important result. But in some way, they were doing a similar thing in slightly different contexts, but they were also able to obtain that kind of fluctuations. Okay? It's very interesting to think about those things. Right. Sorry, going back in here. Yeah, all right, so that was the high temperature, so low temperature. Oh, sorry, beta is bigger than one, sorry, not half. So T is less than one, so this is, this is typo. So critical point is close to the branch point, and then the method speed descent needs care. It, it still holds that the log of this integral is close to just vibrating at the critical point, but that requires a uh, estimation, but it, it turns out to be true. Now then, how do we analyze this quantity and how do we see only the large eigenvalue? That's the uh, discussion here, the heuristic part here. So the critical point is close to lambda one. The, the, the difference is uh, order one over n. On the other hand, the lambda one is close to two with the order one over n to the two third. So that difference is bigger than the, this, this difference. Okay, so that's the thing. So g of gc, if just plug in, and this is an exact formula, I separated out the, the i equals one term, because this is so close to lambda one. That difference is over order one over n, so this log term is log n, so log n over n, and log n over n is smaller than the fluctuation size, so we can ignore, so that will be part over here. And the zc is close to lambda one. Well, so yeah, this is so close to lambda one, we're giving you all the error of, of this size, so that's again part of here. Now this log term, the zc minus lambda, lambda i, now I'm going to expand this zc around, around two. Okay, I, I replace zc by two. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, I'm that, no, sorry, that's not what I'm doing. I'm replacing zc by, by lambda one. So I'm, uh, sorry, this is again typo, this is lambda one. And this is lambda one minus, I think I got uh, some, a few typos here in this very important page. <laughs> um, yeah, this is about lambda one, lambda is uh, uh, similar to two. Yeah, so this is about two. So that's, I think that's what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, okay, but uh, all right, so, let me just say in words. <laughs> yeah, so basically we are doing the tail expansion up to the first, up to the first term. And then uh, the, because of the, the way it works is because one over two minus lambda i, one over z minus lambda i, but basically like this. Um, so then you just collect the terms and then the, fortunately, 
this time here, the end point is two, then it becomes, it, with two, you can uh, approximate by three transformation, because this integral is finite, because of the way that uh, semicircle law decays like at, at, at the edge, like a square root, right? So that gives you that this is finite. Of course, this one requires uh, really care, because if you look at the next term, it will have one over two minus s square, <laughs> and then that term diverges, right? So that, this one is, as written, is a force. So the, the next term has infinite term. So therefore, one has to control that. And it turned out that it can be controlled. It, it, it has a de delicate part. But it's controlled, it is uh, slightly smaller than what we want. So we, we, can, we can make that one. So the linear approximation gives you this lambda 1 minus 2. And that, that gives you the, the, the leading fluctuation. Okay, so that's the uh, technical part that I will not discuss too much about it, but uh, that, that's the, where the entire paper is uh, all about. When, when you say high probability, you have a, uh, you have a precise estimate that you can write on a precise That's right, yeah. yeah. High probability means that yeah, it happens with n, n, n to the minus d, or where d is some fixed number. Yes. Right, so that was the SSK bundle. So the second part is SSK plus CW. CW denotes Curie and Curie Weiss model. So this particular Hamiltonian is called Curie Weiss Hamiltonian, which is interesting by itself. But, uh, but the, the point here is that, okay, here's a uh, uh, SSK part, and here's another quadratic part. I wanna see the interaction. So the coupling constant is M. And if M is zero, of course, we go back to here. If M is so big, then this is much, much stronger then maybe I got our uh, matrix is some, so in that case, uh, this part of the matrix can be written as um, uh, sigma transpose, one, one transpose sigma. In other words, a matrix with all ones everywhere. Okay. So then that is a matrix M is perturbed by deterministic matrix. In other words, the matrix is perturbed by uh, uh, it's a mean zero uh, 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 random matrix. So in that case, the random symmetric matrix with the mean zero mean will appear, and therefore it becomes a spiked random matrix of rank one, and therefore the, we know the, the, the eigenvalue uh, uh, structure. So that limiting framework was also obtained by the same paper of uh, Kosolis and Thurlis and then Jones. So we get the following uh, phase diagram. So here's M, here's T. So if M becomes larger, here's new regime appears. And M equals zero, zero to one, one to T, one to infinity, there are two different regimes. And this here, the, uh, this is lambda one dominates and the trace rhythm appears. And in this part, we have uh, N to the minus one, a linear set takes come up, come up and the Gaussian fluctuations. And here's new regimes appear on the right-hand side. And the, the right-hand side is the part where, again, the largest eigenvalue dominates, just like in here. But the largest eigenvalue is the largest eigenvalue of the spiked random matrix. And then the spike the random matrix, when the spike is, is big enough, then the largest eigenvalue will be separated from your edge, and that new location will be your uh, limiting location. And in that case, you have uh, n to the minus half fluctuations and Gaussian because the largest eigenvalue is not stick to the uh, edge of the uh, semicircle law, but whether it's outside and fluctuating by itself. And then one can compute the uh, uh, transitions between those two things. This is an uh, easy transition. It's the same as the usual uh, spiked random matrix transition. And this transition is a little bit different. This is Gaussian to Gaussian, but different orders. And you go through some non-Gaussian transition. And that was studied by, uh, with, with, with my graduate student, Hao O. Right, so this is all I want to say about the CW matter. And uh, rather, I want to spend the next maybe five to 10 minutes uh, about SK plus uh, external field matter. So here I'm going to talk about free energy, and if there's a time, then I'm going to talk about the actual distribution of the spin itself. Right, so the model is, it's, uh, it's, here's a random quadratic term, and plus H is a constant, uh, it's a coupling constant, with the strength of the external field, and here's sigma transpose and G. So it's a sigma dot G, so it's a linear function in sigma. And G is, we can make it either fixed, make fixed vector, or it is because it's also similar, same, almost same as making G to be a standard normal, normal vector. So that, that's the conventional we're going to take. So you take G to be a, a, 
entries are all independent and they are standard normal distributions. All right, so when H, depending on H, the interesting theorem due to Chen, Dei, and Panchenko is that if H is positive for all temperature, you have Gaussian n to the minus one half behavior for the fluctuations. So in particular, there is no tra phase transition according to temperature. So it works for all temperature. So n h equals zero, there is a phase transition. h equals positive, there is a non-phase transition. So there should be something happens if you vary h according to, to n and scale down to zero. Okay. So that was uh, discussed by uh, Fyodorov and Ladusser. For the case when t equals zero, so they consider the, uh, not the free energy itself, but rather the number of local max and min, so the number of critical points. So when t equals, uh, so sorry, when h equals zero, the usual random matrix situation, because t is equal to zero, is, a, is a max, the usual random matrix situation, number of the critical points is number of eigenvectors, well, plus, times two, because you can do plus and minus sign of the eigenvectors, so there are two n uh, crit critical points. On the other hand, when h is large enough, when h is large enough, this linear term is basically dominating. So in, in the free energy, so you have e to the beta, or in the t equals zero case, the maximization problem. So when you can find the maximum of this over sigma, where this, if h is large enough so that this term is much bigger than this one, in the linear term, this becomes large if sigma and g are parallel to each other. So that's just one particular direction. So the number of the critical points changes from n to one as you h go from zero to positive or large and the transition should occur somewhere. And the argument was that that transition should occur when h is uh, n to the minus one six. Okay, that is supposed to be the transition region. And so our uh, goal is to study that region. Okay. So first of all, there's a random integral formula still works. In, in, but in, this time, when you do the diagonalization of matrix M, U lambda U transpose. U transpose sigma should be your new, new variable. If you do that, this U will be have rotated. So this eigenvector component will be still uh, alive here. So the eigenvector should appear in our formula. So that's the formula here, here's a GG. Here's the eigenvalue part. And here's a part, a new part, which includes the UI transpose G, where UI is the I eigenvector, so I th I th eigenvector, that product to the G will appear in, in, this, in this part. Okay, so that's a new part. So for example, you take a derivative of this one and approximate everything by um, a semicircular. Here's semicircular and here's, this has expected value one. So basically one over N of this, this sum becomes, or, or take a derivative, so it becomes a semicircular. And, and you can check this. Okay. So what is going on here is that with that critical point, plug that back into the G. And this second part, this sum, you can write into two parts with one and minus one. This one is the expected value of this ni squared. So then this one is linear statistics. The linear statistics gives you the fluctuation of order one over n due to the strong, uh, uh, strong uh, repulsion of the eigenvalues. On the other end, this one is there's ni squared over lambda i. ni squared are uh, the coming from eigenvectors and that, that g. And ni squared are going to be, especially ni squared minus one, are going to be iid random variables with mean zero and variance finite. Variance, I think, is one. Okay, so this is, is a iid random variable of centered iid random variables weighted by some random term in front. Now, how is that, what's the fluctuation of that? So that fluctuation is is governed by this, the basically sum of the IID random variables because the central limit theorem gives you the fluctuation order which is given by one over, one over root 10. Well, one over, I think, yeah, one over root 10, which is bigger than uh, one over one over n fluctuations due to the uh, linear statistics. So there is a competition between these terms. And this, so in other words, you can replace this lambda i by classical locations and think of this as a sum of weighted sum of the IID random variables. And that one has higher fluctuations than the linear statistics. So they, they are, they are, their dominance washes out the, the linear statistics information, and that gives you a different scaling. And that is uh, the reason for, uh, um, for the, the result of Chen, Dei, and Panchenko about Gaussian and n to the minus half fluctuations. 
So now what you can do is that we start uh, dialing down this H. So if H becomes smaller and smaller, well, this is a one over square root n fluctuations given by, multiplied by the H squared. And this one has some of log this one gives itself linear statics fluctuation. So there's a competition of these two things. And then they, there's a chance of them to be balanced at some point. So if you balance them, this is what I expect it should be true as at the stage at the moment is a, is a uh, conjecture. We don't, we don't have a proof of this one. Because to prove it, you have to uh, prove various things. Uh, there is uh, some, yeah, which I'm not going to uh, uh, talk in much detail. But this is what one should expect. So when t is smaller than 1 and h is in this scale, the limiting fluctuation should be something like this form. And there's a fluctuation. And fluctuation involves uh, n to the 2 third power. And now let me try to describe this, this fluctuation uh, uh, random variable, fluctuating random variable. Uh, that is in here. This one is equal in distribution to the following thing. 1 minus is a constant, 2 is constant. There's s, alpha 1. h squared is a scaled external field. So the random things are here s, alpha 1, and s of epsilon. All three things, they are all correlated. First, alpha, well, alpha 1. Alpha is, uh, is the uh, GOE airy point process. So that's the uh, point process comes from the large eigenvalues of GOE. Okay? So that forms a Fabian point process, and, and, and that's lambda i's. So the particle lambda i's grows like uh, i to the 2 third as i becomes larger and larger. And new i are independent from alpha i's, and they are also, themselves are also independent. They are standard normal random variables. And then you look for this following equation in S. So using this alpha, alpha i's and mu i's, you build this function in S. And you have 1 minus c over h squared. You equate this, and there is a solution S, which is positive. There is a unique solution S, which is positive. <coughs> and then you define the following function as epsilon of, of S, which is you, you take a portion of this one here. And then you take the, the integral uh, of this form and take a limit as n to infinity, where n is truncation, and n, n to two thirds is truncation. Okay, so this, the issue here is that this is a little bit formal because it's not clear whether this series converges or not, because a new i is, new i is a, a independent standard normal, so new i squared has the expected value one, so this is basically one over, as i becomes large, alpha i, but alpha i grows like i to the two third. Right, so there's, it doesn't converge as it's written. So one has to regularize this. And the recent paper of Landon, Landon and Sosoy in 2019, where they considered, again, similar uh, um, spin glass problem using this similar framework of using random in single integral, they come up with a, they encounter similar uh, difficulty. And this is what they come up with. So if you, not exactly in this version, whether this is replaced by one and this is called zero case. And you, you replace it by its um, expected limiting behavior, replacing this alpha by i to the two third and put it there, and thinking this as a Riemann sum approximation to some integral, and then the integral is exactly this one. And you subtract, and that one converges. So that's just some random variable, depending on s. And taking that S, you plug that in, and you make this combination, and that is expected to be a B, B, B F. Okay, so how does that come about is, well, in this all these formulas, there's a little balance, so you have to find the ZC, exactly like a lambda one plus some number S divided by n to the two-third, and then rewrite everything in terms of, of S and the scaled uh, point process. And then uh, try to rewrite everything in terms of uh, those variables, and then uh, you come up with this, form, this, this expression. Right, right. So let me stop now. So there's a spin distribution part, but I'm going to skip that. So in summary, so spinless, spherical spinless is defined by random Gibbs measure on a sphere, and there are three Hamiltonians we considered. One is SSK, SSK, SSK plus quadratic, deterministic quadratic, SSK plus linear, deterministic linear. Important thing is that there is a random match, random integral formula for the partition function, which one can analyze using the help of random matrix theory. 
and that gives us the fluctuations, and there are interesting transitions, and uh, spin distributions were also studied, but I didn't have time to mention that. Okay. Right. Thank you for your attention. diagram of of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick it, with revised yes this one yes uh, these lines are continuous discontinuous uh, the free energy is con the first derivative is continuous discontinuous how is this yes yeah, so uh, in these so lines th so this part here the so free energy is continuous and in this part it has third order phase transition so it is it's a second derivative is continuous Second order. So, uh, it's third, order third order price transition. I see. So third order derivative is not continuous, but second derivative is continuous. Oh, I see. Um, this part, uh, I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. But this part was, uh, this was the third order price transition. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So for uh, t equals to one case, do you have any like uh, conjecture of the distribution of the fluctuation, order of the fluctuation? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. Like so, for uh, I guess for a Curie-wise model, there is also some similar phase transition, and for t equals to one case. The fluctuation is uh, turns out to be of the order n to the power one fourth or something like that. Right. So yeah. So here, there should be some phase transition between trash rhythm to Gaussian. So this is the largest eigenvalue contribution. This is the linear statics con contribution. So my intuition should be that uh, it is a linear statics of sum of log function uh, of z minus lambda i, but that z should be something like a lambda one plus something, right? So you're talking about, so this is an interesting problem. I mean, uh, this is what I would like to be able to do using maybe remarkable problem, right? So it's a linear statistics problem where the function, test function is depending on n and where the singularity is, is very close to the largest eigenvalue with the same order as the, the spacings of the largest eigenvalue, the largest and second largest eigenvalue. Right, so that's yeah. So that's, that's something that is required to be able to say what that is. Uh, similarly, the you know the derivative version of that was a stress transformation. So stress transformation, you want to study the stress transformation exactly in the order that when z is in the critical scaling, whether we're at the at the edge, z is of order you know two plus constant over n to two third. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly that scaling is is, is required, I think. To be able to say describe what, what those what, what that fluctuations is. Uh, yeah, that so Thank therefore I don't know. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, this uh, limiting random variable you had just at the end, this uh, curly f. Mm -hmm. This one here. Uh, is there is there much known about it or no, this is all I know this yeah yeah so oh. yeah of course right so this description is a little bit on not satisfactory right in the sense that um, um, okay, depending on your perspective right so you may know, knowing that something goes to say the large eigenvalue converges the large the scale the large eigenvalue converges to the the uh, the rightmost point of the airy, uh, GOE airy point process. Well, that is a very satisfactory statement, but we are a little bit greedy, right? We want to know the actual distribution of it, and that's where Trish and Bill come up and saying, oh, here's a formula for in terms of pan level formula, right? So that's very desirable, and <laughs> we'd like to be able to describe the actual distribution in some way, uh, but at the moment, this is all we have. Yeah, so, but it's, as you can see, it's a little bit involved. We have to start with S and then plug that in, and yeah, so in particular, can, do we know anything about this S, E of, e epsilon of S? 
maybe, yeah, so that's, yeah, well, uh, we don't know much about this. More questions? If not, let's uh, thank Jinho again, and we have a coffee break until 11.30. <laughs>